Hi, I'm Elizabeth Cohen, CNN Senior Medical Correspondent, and I have the pleasure and the honor today of interviewing and speaking with Dr. Anthony Fauci, the Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH. Tony, it's so great to have you here with us. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. Tony, the last time you and I were together was in your office at the NIH in October. We were talking about the flu, and it seems like a million years ago. How are you doing through all this? Well, you know, obviously it's very intense, Elizabeth. I mean, this is a historic outbreak now that has been, you know, condensed into a few months. Uh, the, the entire globe is involved. We're having difficult situations that we've had a couple of months ago, last month, and now we're having resurgences in certain states. So it's very intense. Uh, you know, I keep saying somewhat with tongue in cheek, but I mean it like we're running on fumes. <laughs> But the fumes are pretty thick, so we, we've got to do it. There's a lot going on. It's uh, really admirable. Thank um, you. Thank you. So you, you mentioned these surges, and something I've been thinking about, which is when COVID first hit, we weren't even calling it COVID, right? We were calling it coronavirus. When it first hit, there were so many surprises, so many things we didn't know to do. But when you see these surges come, you know, nearly six months in, could some of this have been prevented? Well, I don't think there's any question about that, Elizabeth. I mean, we, we got hit badly. We locked down, you know, uniformly. Some areas like the New York metropolitan area obviously got hit extremely badly. You might recall that there was a period of time when half the cases were in that metropolitan, uh, metropolitan area. So what happened is that obviously it became clear that we needed to not only lock down, but figure out a way how we open up again, because you can't lock down forever, because you'll actually destroy a lot of things in society to do that. But the only way to reopen when you have the dynamics of the epidemic still, the pandemic still present, is to do it in a measured way. And we outline that in the guidelines for opening America, again, very familiar. You know, first we had what's called the gateway. You gotta have the test, the, the, the uh, uh, cases go down. Then you go to one phase, to the other, to the other. What has happened, I guess understandably, but nonetheless regrettably, that people took the attitude in some places of either all or none. Either you're locked down or you just let it fly and you just ignore many of the guidelines of physical distancing, wearing a mask, shaking hands, avoiding, I mean not shaking hands, avoiding uh, crowds, and what happened is you see pictures on the TV of the fact that even in states that are telling their citizens to do it correctly, they're doing that. There are crowds, they're not physical distancing, and they're not wearing masks. That's a recipe for disaster. It's something I spoke about time and again. We do need to open up again, no doubt about it. We want to get the economy back, but you've got to do it in a measured way. And now we're seeing the consequences of community spread, which is even more difficult to contain than spread in a well-known physical location, like a prison or a nursing home or a meatpacking place. When you have community spread, it's, it's insidious because there are so many people in the community who are infected but asymptomatic. It makes it extremely problematic to do efficient contact tracing because most of the people who are infected don't even know they're infected. So how do you do contact tracing when someone doesn't have any symptoms? If you could give the, the country as a whole, the public health system and the country as a whole, a grade for how we have handled this outbreak, what grade would you give? Well, you know, you, it's a good question and I like the way you, you framed it, Elizabeth, because we live in such a heterogeneous country I mean, both geographically, demographically, um, economically, it's so different so that it's almost unfair because if you give the country a grade, you're really neglecting those areas that did it really well, that listened, that shut down, that are opening up with care. There are others that actually didn't listen or they jumped over these guideposts that we had. Um, others got hit really badly like the metropolitan area, and are doing very well now. I mean, if you look at what's happening in the New York metropolitan area, you know, they're doing it really well. They're slowing down. They're, they're watching what's happening as they go from one phase to another. 
and when they see things that might uh, endanger uh, the flow and maybe precipitate an outbreak, they call a timeout and maybe come back a little. That's what everyone has to do. So some grades are going to be A+, plus, some are going to be A, and some are going to be down in C somewhere. Let's talk about the vaccine. There are three companies that are going into phase three clinical trials this summer. How much hope do you have that these vaccines will work and they will work well to get this outbreak under control? Well, as you know, with vaccinology, nothing is guaranteed because you're dealing with biologics. You're injecting innocent people. You have to wait to see what the dynamics of the outbreak is if you get a good signal that it works. So with all those vicissitudes being considered, what I've seen in early data, in the animal data, and in the phase one data, which is primarily for safety, but you get some inkling as to whether or not you can induce the kind of immune response that you would predict would be protective. What I've seen thus far looks good. So with all the caveats that go with no guarantee, I still think that one can say that I'm cautiously optimistic that we will have one or maybe more candidates of vaccines that could be available and be effective by the end of the year, the beginning of 2021. When you say available, do you mean I could go to my doctor or my pharmacy and get the shot by the end of this year, beginning of next year? Yeah. Well, Elizabeth, what, what's different about all of this is that there is a great risk in the, in the, in the uh, uh, provision of resources. So if this were normal business as usual, no emergency, companies would not make investments in the next step until they were sure of the previous step. They wouldn't be manufacturing doses unless they knew the vaccine would work. What's happened now with major investments on the part of the federal government, that when these products reach a certain point, phase two, early phase three, you're going to push the button and already start manufacturing, which means that if you prove that it's effective or not, but let's assume it is, and it's December or January, by that time, you will already have a lot of doses to distribute. In fact, several of the companies, and I, I can't vouch for them, but they're saying it with confidence, several of the companies are saying that by the beginning of 2020 into 2020, excuse me, 2021, and into 2021, they will have hundreds of millions of doses and after a year or so, even as many as a billion doses. So if that's true, and we'll take them on their word, then you and I and others could have a vaccine that we might be able to take in December or January or February. You know, vaccines have different levels of efficacy. If you get two doses of measles vaccine, you are almost 100% protected. But, you know, as, as you and I know, the flu vaccine, even on a well-matched year, is, you know, 40 to 60% protective against, you know, flu. Which do we think this is going to be? Is it going to be 100% we are going to protect against this? Or it might be something less than that? And if so, how much less? Well, as you probably know the answer to your own question, Elizabeth, we don't know the answer to that right now. You've got to do the testing to find out. Uh, I doubt seriously that any vaccine will ever be 100% protected. The best we've ever done is measles, which is 97 to 98% effective. Um, oh, that would be wonderful if we get there. I don't think we will. I would settle for a 70, 75% effective vaccine because that would bring you to that level of would be herd immunity level. So that's, I'm glad you mentioned that number because a CNN poll and other polls have shown that about in this neighborhood, about a third of Americans are not going to get the vaccine. They say they're not going to get it, even if it's free and easy to get, um, or that they're very, very hesitant to get it. If only, say, 70, 75% of Americans are willing to get the vaccine, and it's only, say, I think you just said 70, 75% effective, is that going to get us to herd immunity? You know, unlikely, and that's one of the reasons why we have to make sure we engage the community as we're doing now to get community people to help us, for people to understand that we are doing everything we can to show that it's safe and that it's effective. And it's for the good of them as individuals and in society to
to take the vaccine. So we have a lot of work to do because as you well know, we've spoken about this intensively in the past, there is a general anti-science, anti-authority, anti-vaccine feeling among some people in this country, uh, an alarmingly large percentage of people, relatively speaking. I mean, you, you just have to go on Facebook. It is, there's so many, and th th those groups have really penetrated social media. How are you and other members of the public health world going to get in there and counteract what they've created? All of this, these lies they've created over the years, how are you gonna undo that? It's not gonna be easy, Elizabeth. Anyone thinks it'll be easy is not facing reality. It's gonna be very difficult. It's gonna re require hard work, public messaging by people who they trust. You know, they may not like a government person in a suit like me telling them, even though I will tell them. They really need to see people that they can relate to in the community, you know, sports figures, community heroes, people that they look up to. And so are we working on that kind of a yeah. campaign? Yeah, oh, absolutely. We have, we have a program right now that's gonna be extensive in, in reaching out to the community. Why haven't we seen the phase one data? You mentioned that you've seen it. I don't believe that's been published. It's, it's gonna be literally within days, it, it'll be out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, with, it, it's interesting, the three vaccines that are going to be in phase three trials this summer, they use technology that's never been used in a vaccine that's on the market. This will be the first time. Um, does that give you any uneasiness or? No, not, not really. I mean, I'm, uh, Elizabeth, you know me for a long time. I'm uneasy about everything that we're not sure of, and that's the reason why we do that. I would say that I don't have a major concern about that because it is a, is a good technique. Um, it is easy to scale up. The responses we're getting in the animals and in the phase one look really good. So, I mean, obviously, you always have a little bit concerned because it hasn't been proven over decades, but I think we'll be okay. We're also doing some of the more classic ones. The Chinese are using a very classic one that's resulted in many vaccines on the market. Everyone said it would be slow, but they're in phase three. Right. Um, is it possible they could get a vaccine, the Chinese could get a vaccine before we do? Oh, God bless them. I hope they do. As a matter of fact, I hope everybody that's trying to get a vaccine gets it quickly and effectively and safely. Absolutely. This isn't a competition to win a game. This is, this is a lot of different groups from different countries trying to develop a vaccine that would be safe and effective. I mean, I often get that question, like, are you concerned that somebody's gonna get it before you? Goodness, I hope everybody gets it. I don't really care what order they get it in. And have we spoken to the, you know, the Chinese are, have, have, have many, many teams on this, more than anyone actually um, in human trials. Have, have we, has the US spoken to them and said, hey, let's come up with a plan for sharing in case, you know, you finish first, we finish first? Well, there, there, there's always that. I mean, we're on a phone call every week with the WHO umbrella group and the Chinese are there. These are colleagues I've known for years and years. We talk to each other all the time. Okay. So I, I've thought of you so many times during this outbreak, Tony, because our conversation in October, our conversations over the years, you have devoted your life to fighting these outbreaks, your work with HIV, your work with H1N1, that all speaks for itself. And I've wondered how, how have you felt watching our country um, get into the situation that it's in right now? Well, you know, it, it's, it's difficult uh, to see that. Um, I think what, what people don't understand that there are things that we could have done better and there are things that are beyond our control that have made it much more difficult for us. Um, you know, we are a very big country. We have great heterogeneity. Um, some countries that can do things in a unidimensional way, it's very difficult to do that here. We have a culture that isn't necessarily matched to many of the other countries. You know, the federalism, the states need to do things the way they want to do it. So there's the tension often between direction from the central to the implementation at the state level. You know, that's not an excuse, but there are a lot of things that make how we respond different than how other countries respond. There are a lot of things that we're really very happy with, very excited about, very proud of, and there are certainly things we could have done better. I mean, anybody who denies that is not looking at what's actually going on. You know, this is, so, contact tracing is such an important pillar of, of getting rid of an outbreak or getting an outbreak under control. I've, talk, I've spoken to many, many people who've been diagnosed with COVID. Not one of them was contacted for right. contact tracing. How do you think we're doing with contact tracing? 
I don't think we're doing very well for a number of reasons, not all of which is the fault of the system, in that, you know, I mentioned this uh, over the past few days, that if you go into the community and call up and say, how's the contact tracing going? The dots are not connected because a lot of it is done by phone. You make a contact, 50% of the people, because you're coming from an authority, don't even want to talk to you. Uh, if you're in an area where there are a lot of brown people, people who are Latinx at the border, they're concerned if they give you, if you give them confidential information, it's going to work against them. And then there are those who they'll give you the contact, but you don't exactly isolate them. They get lost in, in the shuffle. That's very, very difficult situation. That we've got to do better on. But what's even more confounding, Elizabeth, what's even more confounding is that when you have a community-based outbreak like it's going on right now in several states, Florida, California, Texas, Arizona, et cetera, what you're seeing is community-based spread where 20 to 40% of the people who are infected don't have any symptoms. So the standard classic paradigm of identification, isolation, contact tracing doesn't work no matter how good you are because you don't know who you're tracing. They're out there. They don't even know that they're infected. So as I mentioned a few times recently, one of the things that we are considering doing is completely blanketing these communities with tests to get a feel for what the penetrance is in the community of infection. You can do that by a number of ways. You can do pooled testing of large numbers of people together in one shot. You can get community people to get boots on the ground and to go out there and look for the people instead of getting on a phone and doing so-called contact tracing by phone. So maybe going out there and doing contact tracing in person is a better exactly, idea. Exactly, exactly. That's, is that, it, can, we, can we get this outbreak under control without good contact tracing? I mean, is it, is it going I to think, be possible or how important is this? I, I think contact tracing is one element of a multifaceted response to control. It isn't the only one, but it's an important one. Tony, do you ever run into people who say to you, you know, I don't know what all this mask stuff is about. I don't know what all this socially dis social distancing stuff is about. I'm fine, my family's fine, I'm gonna go back out there. Oh, absolutely. Anybody? You know, it's understandable, young people, uh, and, and I, I guess I, I'll say it again, I've said it so many times, is that in all of the years that I've been chasing viruses, I've never seen a situation that could lead to such confusion. Of course, with the same pathogen, you have 20 to 40% of the people don't even know they're infected. Then you get another proportion that they know they're infected because they have mild symptoms. Then another group that have moderately severe symptoms, they stay home for a week or two or more and don't feel well for another month. Others require hospitalization. Of those, some require oxygen. Of those, some require intubation. Others require ventilation and some die. So when you have a young person who has little chance, not zero, because young people are getting into trouble too, but have little chance of getting seriously involved, they're saying, what's all the big deal about? I mean, people are getting infected. My friends, I'm in my 20s or whatever. I'm not going to be getting infected. So they do things to propagate the, 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 the pandemic in, a, in an innocent, understandable, but un regrettable way. And that is they don't realize that why they're getting infected, it is likely they're going to infect someone else who will infect someone else who ultimately will infect a vulnerable person. And then you have hospitalizations and deaths. So like it or not, by getting infected yourself, you're not in a vacuum. You're part of the propagation of the dynamics of a pandemic. So you have your own individual responsibility to protect yourself. But you really do have a societal responsibility to be not part of the problem, but to be part of the solution. The extent to which people are infected but are either asymptomatic or so mildly symptomatic that they don't even realize they have COVID, the extent to which that is happening, is that, has that been a surprise to you over the past few months? Is this unusual? Oh, oh yeah, it's very unusual to have a disease that kills a reasonably relatively high percentage of the vulnerables 
the elderly with underlying conditions, even young people with underlying conditions, that same microbe does absolutely nothing to such a high percentage of people. I, I don't know any precedent to that. Usually a microbe that's capable of killing you at least makes most of the people sick. That's not the case here. That's very confounding. Tony Fauci, thank you so much for being with us. We continue to admire your leadership and thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good to be with you.